If you always wanted to play the move 1e4, but not knowing where to begin, or maybe you're already playing the move 1e4, but there are certain lines that you find quite annoying to deal with, whether it's e5, or the Sicilian, the French, or some other system that is quite unpleasant for you to deal with, and you maybe feel you don't really know what you're doing there, yep. Well, I'm Grandmaster Max Lingworth, and in this video, I'm going to teach you how to learn the move 1e4, and give you a repertoire that you can successfully play in your own games with the white pieces. And to start this repertoire, we're going to look at a game that actually was played between two great Russian players, one of the young Russian talents, Vlasov Artemiev, playing as the white pieces against a former world champion, Anatoly Karpov, in a Blitz game in 2021. Now, before I reveal the surprising shortcut that Artemiev played here, do make sure to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm, and definitely subscribe for more Grandmaster Chess videos. So, after e5, the main line is to play the move knight to f3, and then after knight c6, white typically chooses between the Royal Lopez, the Italian game with bishop c4, and the Scotch with d4, with the knight c3 being in fourth place. However, I found when I was starting to learn e4, e5, uh, as white, that when I was trying to learn these main lines, it was a little bit overwhelming for me as a d4 player for most of my junior years. And so, I'm going to repeat the shortcut that one of my chess trainers, Grandmaster Ian Rogers, suggested to me. And that is to play the bishop's opening with bishop c4 as a move order trick to transpose into other systems. For example, let's say if we play knight f3, then we also have to be ready for the Petrov with uh, knight to f6, for example, which was actually played by Jan Napomnishi recently in the World Championship match against Magnus Carlsen in 2021. But with bishop c4, the idea is that we're kind of keeping the option to play knight f3, but in certain lines we might also push that f-pawn forward. For example, let's say after knight f6, d3, and let's say if black were to play knight to c6, well, this is actually what happened in our game. And here we actually have a bit of a, a choice in how we can play it. And this shows the advantage of the lines I'll be showing you is that there's often more than one way to play the position. So if you get bored of playing it one way, there's always another option that you can go for to keep it interesting. Sound good? Well, one way to play it is to play knight f3 and just transpose back into the Italian game, having avoided certain lines that black would go for. Uh, with the normal Italian move order. And then after bishop c5, there are a lot of different moves where normally castles and c3 are the moves that white typically plays at a high level. But there's actually also another move order white can also play, and this is the one that Artemi played in the game, where he decided to play the move knight to c3, just to sort of reduce black's options in certain lines. That, for example, if black goes bishop b4, well, we can play knight g2, and go for a plan like castles and playing an f4 break, which granted would not be possible with the knight on f3, yes or yes. And also if black does play knight to a5, well this is perhaps the disadvantage of the knight at c3 move order. And if you do want to avoid this possibility, then I would suggest playing the move knight to f3 before knight c3. As then the pressure on the pawn stops from playing this idea of trading off our bishop. Uh, however, the game saw bishop to c5. And here Artemi have played the move knight f3, which, fine enough, you could actually reach this position whether you played knight f3 on move 4 or knight c3 on move 4, which is one fun part of these lines. And after d6, you might recognize that this position is one that, well, is very, uh, very symmetrical. And certainly, if you look at schoolboy chess, there are a lot of games that typically reach this position where they play as node s up and are just playing it. But we have a really nice idea to unbalance the game that actually allows us to fight for an advantage at this point. Can you see what that move is with white to play? Maybe you can uh, share it in the comments below. Well done if you came up with the move of knight to a4. This is what Artemi have played in the game and you may recall this idea that we saw with black playing knight a5 or rather having the opportunity to play knight a5 a couple of moves earlier. And this way, idea of trading off the bishop for the, our knight is basically the main way in which we can unbalance the position and fight for the advantage. It's worth pointing out that black can try to avoid this idea. For example, I might play a move 
such as h6 in this position, trying to keep the option of retreating back with the bishop. But in this case, we could also kind of wait and play a move such as h3. And now a very nice trap that's well worth keeping in mind, because most club players don't know about this one. A move like castles is one we'd actually be very happy to see at this point, because now we can use this h6 pawn as a hook for an attack. So the advantages of not castling short already is that we can now play the move g4. And with g4 just going g5, and we're going to attack this pawn, so that when they take, our bishop gets out. So for example, a move like d6 would already be very, very bad for black after g5 takes. And black just doesn't have a good way to deal with the pin here. You've got knight d5 threatening to double the pawns because the knight can't exactly move out here. And with rook g1, the rook is coming into the attack. And it goes to show how if black is just a little bit careless in these lines, we can get a very strong position. Of course, it's also true if black is not forced to castle and he could... For example, play a move like a6 here, or even, for example, you could play a move like a6 in this position, trying to avoid the whole knight a4 idea altogether. But then in turn, we can also castle, and after d6, a very nice idea for white, if we don't have knight a4, is to instead play the move knight to d5. An idea of knight d5 is that a, we've got moves like bishop g5 to pin the knight if black ignores it, so usually black is going to take, yeah? But after this, we now have this quite clear plan where we can play the move c3 and either play the move d4 to get a nice space advantage in the center, possibly we'll move h3 at some point then to not allow black to gain bishop b4. So, for example, after h6, well, in this case, yeah, if you want to play d4, you probably will want to play h3 around this point, uh, or actually even takes, takes is pretty good in this particular version, but say... If black were to take on d4 first, then certainly in a position like this one, well, we can see that here, well, a move like a3 would kind of make sense to stop them getting their bishop to g4, uh, or bishop e 3 if you don't really care about it. But okay, but this sort of shows what white is aiming for on a general level of getting this strong center uh, supported by the bishops, which after all have some quite active diagonals. And finally, if they do castle, then it's going to be kind of similar to ideas that we've already seen before, but you can also try to punish their move order a little bit by playing bishop g5. And okay, obviously our opponent is not going to fall for d6 and knight d5 exploiting the pin. That's something you see quite a lot in scholastic tournaments, let's say under 12 years of age. Of course, black can play it with moves like h6 and then play d6 to try to keep the, to play it this way. But here as well, I mean, our plans like knight d5 castles come pretty naturally, and similar ideas to what we've seen before will give white some chance of an edge here also. In any case, the game saw d6, and now that we have seen a lot of the move order points and that this side is not as easy for black to equalize as it might look, well, we can now see how the game plays out, and I mean, the move that Karpov plays here is not really the best one. I think it's quite important to play bishop b6 here, so that if white does play knight takes b6, well, at least black is able to keep this structure quite solid on the dark squares. It does complement the bishop quite nicely. And white should probably play a move like a3, just making sure that black is not able to use the same idea back on white to get the bishop pair, yeah? And it's a position that probably is objectively close to equal, but you could argue that white, with this bishop pair advantage, has some scope to outplay the opponent from this point. Instead, Karpov played the move h6, which I do consider to be a little bit imprecise at this point. In fact, it turns out to be an outright mistake. Uh, it wasn't shown in the game, but actually white could have played the move knight takes c5. And that is a very important move that white has to obtain a very clear advantage. Let's see if you can find it with white to play. So we're going to see in the game that this structure in general is just very good for white, with white having the bishop pair and black having a doubled pawns. But here it's especially strong because of the move bishop to b5. Simply threatening to take on e5, or if black were to castle to remove the defender and then take on e5. And if black were to play some move such as queen d6 trying to defend everything, well, we simply take and give black these very crippled, tripled pawns on the c file, which of course, after something like knight d2 and putting knight on c4, white just has a decisive strategic advantage because of the fact that black has so many weak pawns on those dark squares. And also we have an unopposed dark square bishop to attack him as well, yep. 
Against Dead White Plague Castles, it is true that this was just a, uh, a Blitz game, so maybe this is why the players did not see this uh, this Bishop E5 idea. Well, Karpov decided to stop it with A6, but the problem is that this structure is still very, very nice for White, where Black still has got the double pawns, and White now just plays this move of uh, Bishop to B3, just anticipating any attack on the, uh, on the Bishop, as it were. For what it's worth, it's probably more precise to play the move bishop to e3 to attack the pawn and maybe a move like a4 in such a position might be a better way to secure the, the position of the bishop. Uh, or even just to ignore it and just play, let's say, a3 and just ask black, well, what is your idea? Uh, sometimes in these positions you can even play like for a c3 b4 break and kind of trade off the double pawns, but in the process improve your structure and open up the position for the bishops. Uh, but okay, bishop b3, while not the most precise move, it doesn't overly affect the evaluation of the position, where still white position is slightly more pleasant here. Uh, bishop e3 was played, and now instead of the move bishop g4, which might actually still be quite playable for black, with ideas of potentially castling long and trying to create some counterplay against the white king. Well, instead of this, black played the move knight to d4, and I think that this is where the game starts to shift very heavily in white's favour. So why exactly is knight to d4 a strategic mistake? Well, the answer is that if we play knight d4 as Artemiev did in the game and then retreat the bishop, well, white just has the much more flexible pawn structure, yeah? Compared to a king's Indian where white's bishop would normally be on g2, the bishop is an absolute monster on this open diagonal on b3. Meanwhile, white is ready just to play f4, let's say if black were to castle, then f4. is giving white an extremely strong attack here. Where if black takes, we just get our bishop into the game and our rook comes into the attack. We now have a central space majority. And that combined with a lean development does effectively give white, I think, a close to winning advantage after queen f3. And some e5 also, even just kicking the knight. White's initiative is simply too strong, yeah? Well, black plays g5 trying to avoid this f4 plan. However, well, one funny point is you could actually play the move f4 anyway. It actually doesn't completely succeed in stopping this idea because if black were to take twice on on f4 in this position white has a very nice tactic based on the fact that black king is stuck in the center in the move e5 and black is not able to take that pawn because rookie won and the queen is lost right but instead if they go queen to e7 uh, or some other move to defend the queen then you know takes takes and white even though he's down a pawn just has a winning attack with queen f3 uh, there are other winning moves as well but i mean we're just going to bring the rook in the attack with queen f3 also stop black from potentially castling long because the queen is after all attacking the b7 pawn and i mean it's just absolutely hopeless for black if you castle short your king is just way too open to survive there yeah but okay artemiev did not realize that g5 doesn't actually stop the move f4 and he believed his opponent, but even so, c3 is still much better for white. Uh, the game went c5, cd4, cd4. And okay, I think it's possible probably to play f4 here as well. Uh, white played move queen e1 instead, which actually kind of has a similar idea and still gives white a big advantage. Uh, probably black has to go bishop e6 and try to at least, you know, get the king castled at some point. Because in the game after b6, which I think is just a way too slow a move at this point. Well, at this point, Artemi realized, oh, I can actually play the move f4. Because, well, if they take this way, I'm going to have e5. So gf4, bishop takes f4. And, well, we saw this ef4, e5 idea already. True or true. But instead of that, black goes for bishop e6. But the problem is that the position is just basically strategically lost for black. Because he doesn't have a safe spot for the king. And white's pieces are just coordinating a lot better. Our uh, game concluded knight d7. Bishop to b4. Knight c5. White played a move rook to c1. Just keeping this tension on the knight. And continuing to develop. Though apparently bishop takes c5 is a little more precise first. To well have some idea like rook f6. Where you just fix the pawn as a weakness. That makes it much easier to destroy. And also makes it harder for black to castle his king. Yeah. The game saw rook c1, take, take, castles, and now with the move queen to h4, white is just preparing to bring in the big guns for the attack on the open black king. 
King to G7 is played to cover this Rook F6 threat. Rook F3 just prepares to lift the Rook into the attack. And also, after Queen E6, Rook Cf1, we see that the other Rook is now all in the attack as well. And so this is just basically a lost position for Black. Clearly, Rook to F6 is a very big threat, yeah? Threatening to take on F6 and set up some mating ideas with the lawnmower. So F6 was played, but now a very deadly retreat, which is maybe why it's not so easy to see, but well done if you realise that with the move Bishop D2 that Black is not able to defend this pawn and also keep this pawn defended. As we see in the game after Rook H8, White simply removes the defence with Rook F6, and since there are all the pieces flooding in the attack, you know, Bishop H6 and some mating ideas coming, this is why Karpov resigned at this point. Well, it's not every day that you see Anatoly Karpov lose a game in just 26 moves, and okay, it is a blitz game, but even so, I think a very instructive example of how you can outplay your opponents in these lines. I should point out, by the way, that some of the lines I'm recommending in this video have some similarities to the ones that I recommend actually in my course play E4 Like Ikaru. I've included a link in the description if you would like to check that out and go much deeper into your E4 mastery. But the nice thing about these lines I'm showing you is that, well, like some of them are similar to lines I recommend in the play for like Ikara course, but they can also be played kind of as a standalone recommendation as well. And also with these recommendations, it's very easy for you to kind of expand your repertoire later. So for example, let's say if you really like this line with knight to f3 and with knight c3, well, you can play it for a lot of different move orders. I mean, you could start with knight f3, you could start with bishop to c4, and you could even start with the move knight c3, which instantly is the move what is my main recommendation in this aforementioned play for, like Ikaru, of course. So that means even if you forget the exact move order, it's very easy to put your piece on the natural squares, and then use the plans I mentioned to get the unfair advantage over your opponents. But of course, one thing to keep in mind is that each move order does have its pros and its cons in terms of what you allow and what you avoid. And this next thing I'm going to show you are uh, between uh, Krikos of Agmeketarian, a famous uh, Brazilian GM and chess streamer, against the Indian I am Vianney Suna Antonio. I will kind of show some of these move order points. Because in this game also, uh, White played the move Bishop to C4. This is another Blitz game, or this one from Tile Tuesday 2019. And so there's only really one disadvantage, I would say, to the Bishop's opening move order. In it. Okay, with this move order, you're avoiding the Petrov, as I noted before, but you are also giving Black the option to play the move C6, with the idea that after D5, our bishop is going to come under attack. The good news is that it's not as scary as it looks, because after knight F3 and D5, well, the good news is that we're actually not forced to take that pawn on D5. What we can do instead is we can play the move bishop to B3, just keeping the tension in the center. And it's a line where I think most of your opponents, especially below, let's say, a 2000 or 2200 level, are definitely not going to be well prepared for this line, as there's a little bit of a sideline. And Black's best moves are not necessarily the most natural ones at this point. Well, the game itself is kind of a good example, because Black played D4, which we will see later is not the right move. But before I get to that, a few alternatives. The move that is kind of the old main line is to move Bishop to D6, just trying to defend the... <clears throat> the center. But what we see is that black center is also potentially a little bit overextended in this line. And that with the move... Well, there are actually two ways you can play it. You can either play the move knight to c3 directly. With the idea that we're just putting a lot of peace pressure on the center. And, well, if they play d4, which might be one of the better moves for black. We just go knight e2 and we kind of get a similar structure to what we saw... Artemiev get against Karpov, yeah, where White was preparing the f4 break and also had c3 as a break in the position. And also, I need to keep in mind is that it's very much an improved version of a King's Indian type position for White, because if you compare this to a King's Indian, well, we see that, well, Black took two tempi to play c5, yeah, so he took some time to get his ideal structure. Again, our bishop is a lot more active on b6 and on g2. And also we have this very nice positional idea, um, which is very well worth committing to memory to play to move knight h4. With the idea that we are both preparing to put our knight into f5, potentially queen f3, g3 can back up the attack with a knight. And in some positions we can also play f4, yeah, and bring our rook into the attack. And we just have this very ready-made offensive against the black king. 
It's my position where the engine only gives a tiny edge to white, but on a human level, it is so much easier to play from white's perspective, yeah? Um, and you can also play ED5. This is another approach where you kind of release the, the tension in the center, but still, like, if they take with the pawn, you've got similar ideas of bishop g5, knight c3, and you're putting, again, a lot of pressure on the center with your pieces, so it's also a very valid approach for white if the if you want a more open position rather than a more closed one. Uh, the best moves for black are actually ones that aim to get an improved version of the bishop d6 lines we saw. So, for example, a move like bishop b4 is a move that is uh, is seen at a higher level with the idea that if white goes c3, that black is actually wanting to provoke c3 with an extra tempo so that white doesn't have knight c3 to attack this pawn. But you can also play bishop to d2, and okay, I talked about this line a lot more detail in my uh, in my play uh, e4 like Ikara course, but it is a line where after queen d2 or knight d2, where again, you know, we've got a little pressure on the center and black has to be quite precise in order to maintain the balance. Um, so we can sort of see here that, well, this line, still white is getting some chances to set some problems for black and it's not as easy as black is memorizing one or two moves to equalize, yeah? He has to kind of work for it. Now, returning to the move D4 that was played in the game. Well, what would be your move here is white? Because it might look like black is setting a trap, but he's actually fallen into our trap, it turns out. So what does that mean? Well, here, yeah, hopefully you didn't play the move knight takes E5, because that runs into queen A5, and unfortunately you win the, uh, the knights as black in this case. Well, unfortunately for white, we could say... However, in a way, this is one reason why this can be such a good blitz weapon at lower levels, or just a good weapon in general, let's say below 1600, because, and of course above that, but certainly the point is that your opponent might think, oh, they didn't realize that knight e5 runs into queen a5, so they think they're trapping us, right? But then it turns out we're trapping them, because with the move knight g5, it suddenly becomes clear that black doesn't have a good way to defend this pawn on f7. And in the game, black had to play bishop e6, um, Mekaterian played the move, knight takes e6, uh, I mean, to be fair, there is also bishop e6, if you want a more positional approach, then this does also give white a very big advantage, and it was also a game that I saw in Blitz that I was considering to show, of showing how to play this kind of endgame, because with the double pawns, white does have a clear advantage, and so he plans like a4, putting the knight on c4, and attacking e5 is quite easy to play. But I kind of like the dynamic way this game played out, so let's see it for a few more moves. Where we had knight takes e6, f e6, and... So in this line, it's kind of an interesting point that... After e takes d3, that white doesn't take the pawn back, but decides to play in Paul Morphy style. And sacrifice this pawn in order to maximize his lead in development. So in any case, the game continued with queen e7. There's not really the best way for black to play, but I will show... A few more moves just so you get an idea of how the position can play out. So take, take. Knight bd7, knight c3. So we're seeing that white is developing very fast. And that black is not really in time to get the king castled short. As the center is a bit too open. And of course the queen is in the way of the bishop. So black decides to castle long. But what we see here is that white's bishops and lean development. And open lines do give him a quite good initiative. In fact a move such as... Rook b1 and b4, b5 would actually be a very effective plan in this position. Just using this pawn as a hook to open up the king. Uh, in the game instead, white played bishop to e3. Uh, black played king to b8. And okay, admittedly bishop b3 is probably not the most precise. And I guess we can say that the rest of the game may not be so relevant for our purposes. As I think here black has managed to somewhat consolidate. And there's a reason why I would probably recommend the move bishop takes e6 instead. As the more secure way to get a larger advantage. But 96 is a more dynamic approach if you want to sacrifice a pawn for initiative, if you're more of a gambitier type of player. So that's this game, and let's uh, move on to what to do when black doesn't play the move e5. As you can see, how I recommend the bishop's opening, but you could just as easily use these ideas with knight f3 or potentially even a two knight c3 move order, depending on what you want to allow or what you want to avoid. So moving on to the Sicilian, you might be wondering what if I decide to recommend against the Sicilian defense, which if you're playing at, let's say, a level of maybe 1600 to 2500, you're probably going to face c5 more often than e5, whereas if you're below 1600, you'll probably face e5 more often, yep. So with the Sicilian, there are obviously a lot of ways in which you can play against it. 
And actually, I've done some videos in the past where I recommended the Alapin Sicilian with C3, just going for a direct D4. But for this video, I want to suggest something a little bit different, and I've decided to actually go with the very similar line to what I recommended in the play E4 like Ikara course, as in playing the close ceiling with Knight C3, and then playing the Grand Prix attack with F4. And what I like about the Grand Prix attack, from the perspective of a club player or an online player playing it, is it's just very easy to kind of play this up, and very easy to understand White's ideas in it. You can very often play the same setup in a lot of cases. For example, this game here between Asgar Azade against Korobov is a very nice example of White actually won in just 18 moves. So I'm going to show you the full game first of all, and then I'll quickly cover a few alternatives after that. Sound good? Well, this line of black play with the sort of dragon setup is definitely the critical one. And now Bishop b5 is quite a nice approach, with the idea that if black plays a move such as d6, well, we can double their pawns with bishop takes c6, d3, and just have quite a pleasant advantage after knight f6 and castles, where, you know, black's got these double pawns that are arguably more significant than their bishop pair advantage. And also if they castle, it's very easy to play queen e1. And to go for a very similar attacking setup to what we're actually going to see in the game, I don't want to spoil it right away, but if you have some experience with a Grand Prix attack, you'll probably recognize already how white can uh, build up the attack against the black king from this sort of position, using his extra space in the center. But in the game, Korobov defended correctly. The Ukrainian GM played the move knight to d4. And here in my play e4 like Ikaru course, I recommend the move a4, as this was the main move that Nakamura was playing, with the idea that knight b5, a b5 kind of improves your structure by opening up the file for the rook. However, in this game, Asgar Azade played the main line of castles, and, well, even if you already have my course, uh, then still you may find it useful to see how the castle line plays as well as a possible alternative approach. And again, it shows you just how flexible the E4 lines I'm recommending are, that if one of the lines is not completely to your taste, it's very easy to find another way to play the positions in a different kind of style. So, after castles, black played the move knight takes b5, certainly the most natural to eliminate the bishop. Uh, if they do play the move a6, just out of interest, where would you retreat this bishop if you're playing as white? So, my suggestion would be either to play bishop e2, although I think the arising position here is a little bit passive with the bishop here, so I don't think it's really that critical. Or maybe a bit more challenging is to play bishop d3, which admittedly looks very weird in this position, but the idea is that, let's say if they play d6, you're just going to play knight takes d4 and kind of give a choice of either misplacing their bishop, or if they go cd4, well, you go knight e2 and kind of say that, well, they've got the doubled pawns, so the structure is a bit less flexible for black. Granted, their position is probably still equal anyway, but it's a way in which you can, you know, play c3, maybe undouble the pawns in this, uh, uh, in this kind of fashion, but where you at least are able to, you know, open up the, the position, get a kind of open Sicilian type structure where, okay, it's an equal position, but this is the way that chess is. If the opponent plays the best moves in the opening, you're not going to force an advantage in the long term. So, as a worst case, it's not so bad. Uh, in any case, the game instead saw knight b5. And here again, black should probably play some move like a6 or maybe d6 and play it in a dragon style. But in the game, Korobov goes knight to f6, to which white plays d3. Uh, you could also go e5 if you want to kick the knight away, but it is true that if black had played d6 and then knight f6, then okay, you're not really getting this uh, this e5 possibility yet. And this would in fact transpose to the game uh, eventually if we saw this move order. So black goes knight f6, d3, black castles. Not quite sure why black didn't play d6 yet. Perhaps he was considering playing a move like d5 instead. But after d5 here, it works quite well just to play the move e5 in response, where we now switch to playing it more positionally, where the knight and bishop end up on quite awkward squares, yep. And if uh, knight e8, then d4. We just grab a very nice space advantage. If they take, our knight gets a nice outpost on d4. And so position is just very pleasant for white due to his very strong dark squared control at this point. So to avoid this, Korobov played d6, but now we get to use an attacking plan that, okay, it's true that it perhaps works even better with the bishop on c4, but even without the bishop, it's still quite dangerous. And that is to play the move queen to h4. 
So what is the idea of Queen H4? Well, we're going to see the idea actually play out in the game uh, as to what White is setting up with this Queen move. So just keep your eyes peeled. We have the move C4 by Black. Actually quite a good move to try to open up this diagonal. And of course, DC4, Knight E4 would be quite a nice trade for Black to eliminate White's center. So White just plays Knight C3, bring the Knight back to safety and saying that, well, now the move Queen B6 is not so effective when White can just play King H1 and leave the Queen hanging, as it were. Now, it's sort of an interesting practical point to note that this is a sort of position that if you turn to computer, computer says it is just equal because Black has this very nice idea of playing B5, saying that, okay, you can't take the pawn because Queen B6 is an annoying fork, and otherwise Black's getting counterplay here in time to more or less maintain the balance. But okay, B5, not the easiest move to find in the Blitz game, admittedly, and in the game, Korobov made a very big mistake with B6, which is simply way too slow for the position, and this is a good moment to, for you to see if you can understand how white attacks Black's king in the Grand Prix attack. So, what would be your move if you were white in this position? Perhaps you thought to include the, your move in the comments below. Uh, this move is on move uh, 13 of the Korobov game, in case you uh, want to use a notation. But yeah, the move is the move F5. So, well done if you found this move merely white. It's still better even if you play some quiet move like King H1, but a move like King H1 is kind of superfluous when you can just go directly for the attack with G takes F5, and, you know, Bishop H6 is very thematic at this point, where you just play to, you know, eliminate their bishop, and also, say if they take, take, well, you're ready to go Knight G5, attack this pawn, and then remove the defender with Knight D5. And you can very easily get a checkmating attack with these sorts of ideas, where, okay, computer says if you play knight g4, you're not dead lost as black, but it's still a very strong attack here, like queen h4, and still the same knight g5 and knight d5, the same ideas still work extremely well for white. Not to mention the rooks can also very easily come into the attack with a rook lift at this point. So that's kind of showing white's attack in action, and black's attempt to try to reduce the damage by not taking the pawn on f5 actually makes things worse. So after bishop a6, white now plays the move bishop h6 anyway, realizing that actually black is not in time to take on d3. Because if black does take, we can now play bishop takes g7, since after all takes takes would lose a piece for black at the end of captures. Yes or yes. Now after king g7, rook fd1, well now we can switch to attacking on a different angle, where we just go e5, exploiting that pin on the pawn to the queen. Keep in mind, rooks are often very strong when placed opposite the enemy queen to start bringing up some tactical ideas. Now, after knight g8, I think that we've simply f takes g6 and knight g5, that white simply has a completely decisive attack. Uh, it's a bit of a long analysis, but just to kind of show how this attack plays out, the point is after take, take. The white now has this very deadly move of knight d5, and it turns out the black just doesn't have a good defense to queen d4. And a knight coming to f6, setting up some deadly, uh, deadly, what's the word, deadly windmills with the queen and knight. And if you go f6, of course, knight e6, and that's a family fork right there, yeah? So, I draw a lot of arrows, but I think you, you see the Picasso painting uh, for all of the ideas in it. Anyway, black plays bishop takes h6, and then tries to cover himself with e6. Problem is that y is just too fast, and after knight g5, queen to e7... White finds a very nice move to pretty much end the game instantly. So, well done if you found this idea, by the way. Uh, if we could remove the 9 on f6, then this would be checkmate with queen h7. But it's worth pointing out fg6 is not an immediate uh, killing blow. In fact, it's actually quite a big mistake, because rook f6 doesn't work when the queen is defending the square, yeah? But what we can do is we can get there another way with f with the move e5. And after d takes e5, knight c4... Uh, Korobov resigned in this position, and the reason that he resigned is that after knight c4, you can't take because of queen h7 mate, clearly. And if you try to move the rook out of the way, say rook f to d8, so that after take, take queen h7, you at least have a retreat square with king to f8. The problem is that white just plays f takes g6, uh, or f takes e6, but, I mean, yeah, you're clearly breaking through on the f file, and black is not able to take the knight because of queen of g f7 mate, so this is how the game could possibly have ended had black not resigned. Anyway, a very 
uh, instructive example and a very clear demonstration of how this sort of attack by white, I think you'll agree, is very easy to execute even in a blitz game, whereas black has to make some quite difficult defensive decisions that, in this case, were beyond the ability even of a GM rated 2700 plus on FIDE, which is, let's say, top 30 to 40 in the world. Of course, it's true that black can try to play it differently. For example, it's obviously much harder to go bishop b5 if they haven't played the move knight c6, yeah? But, I mean, if they play, let's say, d6 and try to delay this knight c6 in this way, I mean, you can still play the move bishop to b5 in this position anyway. It's still a legitimate move, even though it may be slightly less effective when they can go bishop d7. But on the other hand, you could also potentially play a move like bishop c4 and claim you have an improved version of bishop c4 lines when they can't attack your bishop with e6 d5. Which, by the way, is the reason I decided not to recommend bishop c4 in a line where black play knight c6 in place of d6. For those of you who have some experience with the open ceiling, you might also even find it interesting to play a move such as d4 and transpose back into an open Sicilian, where, okay, if your opponent does not normally play the dragon uh, in the Sicilian, then this could be a little bit of a unpleasant move order. Like, let's say if they normally play the Sveshnikov, or they normally play the uh, the Nidorf, or they normally play the Taimanov, or some other system. Well, obviously, this is very different to these lines, and this is a way in which you could potentially set some problems to the opponent with your move order. So, in any case, there are a lot of different ways in which you can play f4. Um, of course, if they completely refuse to play knight c6 altogether. Uh, well, I mean, you can still potentially play bishop b5 in some positions, or if they do stop it altogether with the move a6. It's worth knowing that the decent plan b can be to play just d3 and g3 and just transition back to a more g3 close ceiling setup. Well, you could argue that maybe the a6 move is not the most useful for black, although, of course, objectively, black is doing fine here. And again, the nice thing about knight c3 is that it's very easy to expand your repertoire later, where, let's say, for example, you're already thinking about becoming a candidate master or a fide master or some other higher title. Well, it's quite easy to add other lines within this. For example, after knight c6, you can play moves like bishop b5, which is kind of an improved Grand Prix attack, where you still kind of try to double their pawns and, you know, go for similar ideas to what we saw in the f4 lines earlier. And there are also other systems where, for example, after d6, there are lines where you could play knight g2 and potentially transpose into an open Sicilian, but where you maybe avoided certain lines along the way. Or, for example, knight f6 or even some tricky move orders, like g3, where you kind of keep them guessing about whether you're going to transpose to an open scene with d4, or whether you're just going to play a closed Sicilian with some, uh, you know, with some d3 instead. So you kind of can choose between different move order tricks to get the opponent out of something they might be familiar with. Uh, and to get a position that you're also comfortable with. So that's kind of some of the different possibilities with knight to c3. Uh, I mean, at some point you may decide to also learn two knight f3, but it is also a lot more work to learn the open Sicilian, because then you have to be ready for every single major system that black can go for, and there are a lot of ones that they can play. Whereas with knight c3, we kind of force them onto our territory, and we get our type of position and a very easy system for us to follow, rather than have to do something different against each system that they play. So on that note, let's move on to the next possibility at Black's disposal, and the line you're going to face, I think, the third most often after the big two of e5 and c5 that we've seen, is the move of e6, the French defence, and admittedly for some of these lines, this is where we go a bit more advanced, because certainly there are some lazy approaches available where you could, in theory, kind of just start playing these lines and sort of skip ahead and kind of just build up some experience as you go, or say, if your opponents are playing a lot of this in your game, so you say, okay, maybe it's time to look it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to divide this video into two parts. So this is going to be Learn E4 Part 1, where we already looked at the moves E5 and C5. And then in Part 2, I'm going to look at all of the remaining moves where Black doesn't play E5 and C5. So I will see you guys in Part 2, which should be up there as a suggested video as well when it is released. So I'll see you guys then, and good luck playing the move E4.